Yeah. How are you? Uh, I'm Morten, a colleague of uh, Anders Wolfred in uh, Damaris, Norway. Uh, first of all, how ma many of you have heard about this uh, show, Shame? Uh, yeah, some of you have. <laughs> the Norwegians have. Uh, and you are outside of uh, Norway. You probably will. Uh, you see that this began as a small Norwegian uh, show for teenagers, but suddenly it has become an international phenomenon and it will probably be some of the greatest exports we have from Norway besides oil and fish and uh, whatever export Norway is famous for. In China, Chinese fans have copied the show and uploaded it on YouTube with Chinese subtitles. So by now, six million Chinese teenagers have seen this show, uh, which is uh, more teenagers than is in Norway, of course. <laughs> and so it's so amazing. And they describe it as a show that they feel is closely knit to their own life, a show that illustrates their everyday life, with the characters struggling with familiar challenges. So there is something about this small Norwegian show that teenagers, even in China and all around the world, feel that uh, express something about how real life is for them. And I understand these teenagers. You know, I consider myself a rational, moderate person who is disciplined, but I have to admit, at times when I have been watching this show, uh, I have not functioned well in my daily job. It's been hard to cover my primary basic needs as food and sleep. Uh, I, I could sometimes lie awake at night reflecting on the relationship issues from the show. Why does he not text her back? Uh, <laughs> can't he see that they are perfect for each other? Uh, why does he treat her that way? Those things could keep me up because it's so engaging. And we're going to spend some time talking about this show, what it tells us about youth culture and how we can relate to this as Christians. And in Damaris, Norway, have you heard about Damaris before? Uh, if you have heard, uh, raise your hand so I can see. Yeah, Norwegians and some other foreigners. Uh, <laughs> you know, since we are Norwegians, everyone else is foreigners. <laughs> That's how self-centered we are. And when a, a Norwegian show goes international, uh, we feel so proud that we even lecture about it abroad. So, <laughs> but in, in Damaris, Norway, we make resources for churches, youth ministries, and schools. And there are two main areas that we engage with, and that's apologetics and popular culture. And those are closely related. In order to make a good case for Christianity, we got to understand who our listeners are. So in Damaris, we try to keep up with the trends, and actually, this show, Shame, we wrote about it, or more precisely, Anne Solfred uh, wrote about it uh, one day before secular media uh, caught up with it and understood that this is a huge thing. So we try to keep up secular show that are really popular in Norway, and as an introduction, I just want to give some perspective on why I think it's important for us, the Christians, to engage with this. And, uh, this is a quote from Walt Miller. He says that, get to know the media and you get to know them. Uh, who are they? Well, we're talking about the youth and the youth culture. And, you know, media and popular culture can teach us a lot about the people that are watching. And this show shame. Uh, basically, all the teenagers in Norway uh, and all around Europe are, are watching this. Not all around Europe yet, because it's still in Norwegian, but uh, it's coming. And it both, you know, shapes how the teenagers are, and it also reflects how they are. Shapes and reflects. And there was a Norwegian pastor who stated that every grown-up working with youth ministry should spend time on this series, because it gives them a peek call into their life, their values, their needs, their worries, their fears, their victories. And this quote from Miller tells us how important that is to know the young generation. And we get to know them through getting to know what they are watching. So that's one perspective. Another perspective is this. Uh, the movie director, Brian Ganova, can you see this, by the way, or is it small? Yeah. Uh, he says that no story exists neutrally as raw entertainment without reference to cultural beliefs and values. And 
you know, of course, every story that we hear, every story that is in the media wants to say something to us, wants to tell us something, wants to touch, change, meet our hearts and needs. And it would be so easy to just look past this, uh, to not take notice of the messages we hear in popular culture, because we are part of that same culture. It's all around us, everywhere. Uh, but every story teaches something, whether we take notice of it or not. It does. And these stories are about people with beliefs, values, and desires. And it's also made by people with beliefs, values, and desires. So when we engage with this, try to learn what it teaches. It teaches us something about the values in our society. And one last perspective is that uh, youth spend a lot of time on media. They spend a lot of time on watching these shows. And me, uh, uh, I, which is a, a social scientist, no, she is a professor in uh, religious sociology in Sweden. She says that media is a more frequent area than family and church for contact with religious ideas and values. And they teach more about religion from media than from family and church. That is so amazing. And, and what do we do as Christians? Well, I think we have to do what John Stott called double listening. And he said that we're going to have to listen to the voice of God in Scripture and listening to the voices of the modern world with all their cries of anger, pain, and despair. We got to listen to both the word and the world in order to uh, engage with people and tell people, present people to the gospel. So what do we find when we listen to this show, Shame? Uh, what is good? What can we learn? What ideas and lifestyles do we see there that we have to challenge? And uh, Anna Solfred is going to tell us, yeah, what do we find when we listen to these series? Uh, I'm just going to introduce you to the series, to the, to, um, to the show and to the characters, and how the broadcaster um, were thinking when they made this show. These are some of the main characters. You have five girls, in a, they are 16 year old, and they go to school in our capital, uh, Oslo. Uh, you can see straight away that they are different. Uh, they have different beliefs, values, uh, religion. Uh, and they do not know each other when they, um, the first year, the first season. They are very insecure in different ways, but they find together in this group. Every uh, season is uh, targeting one of these. The first season is Eva, the one with the glasses. The whole season one was about her. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more about her later. The next season was Nora. Nora, uh, the one to the right to you. Uh, then it's Isaac, it's a boy, he's not here. This season, going on right now, is Sana. She's a Muslim. Uh, and uh, we, are see, we are shown her struggle to uh, fit in with her um, Muslim beliefs, her tradition, her family into the modern society. When the broadcaster were planning this show, they wanted to target a very narrow audience. They have had success targeting narrow audiences before. They have made this hugely successful show for nine-year-olds before. So now they, now they wanted to target the 16-year-olds. But what happened was that they were so clever uh, in showing the, uh, the deep longings that they reached out to nine-year-olds, to 16-year-olds, to 30-year-olds, to 60-year-olds. They were crossing borders in nations, in religions, in generations. Um, and what they did when they were making it, instead of uh, uh, 
talking to two or three 16 year olds, they talk to many, hundreds. What are they thinking about? What are their hobbies? What are their fears? Uh, what are they expecting of the future? What are they struggling with? What are they happy to do? Uh, and when they were uh, trying to find the actors when they were running auditions, they still had no name for this concept. So they asked all the participants to suggest a name. So the actors suggested shame. They had a vote and they all voted for shame. What does that tell, tell us? Young actors wanting a show about something they felt were uh, needed and were real to them. They wanted a show about shame. Uh, right now we are in, in the middle of season four. The seasons are quite short and they are making this in very rapid pace. Um, there has just been a two week break in season four and they have made the last five episodes in those two weeks. Some of it. Um, to be current to relate to th the things happening uh, in reality. They are uh, taping it as close up to the time they are showing it, running it as possible. Uh, and they, by creating a two weeks break, they are leaving a cliffhanger. Because the way it's uh, run, they are uh, making it into, instead of one episode sold every week, they release a piece and bits and pictures every day. And sometimes two or three times a day. So you have to be on this webpage uh, checking. And that's why uh, Morten Marius didn't sleep, because you could, you didn't have to wait until Friday. The, uh, this boy could answer today or tonight or tomorrow morning when you wake up. So you took your phone and the first thing you did in the morning was not checking Facebook, it was checking shame. Uh, the first season was Eva, Eve, is her name. Uh, she was born and raised in a different city, so she was very lonely. Her parents are divorced. She lives with her mother, which we don't see because she works in Geneva. Um, and she struggles to find her identity. She has a different dialect. She has no friends. Uh, and we watch her grow to find her self-confidence during the first season. The next season is about Nora. Her parents are a psychologist uh, and a sexologist. Do you say that? Uh, which is, they are just absurd about sex and they don't care about me. They say. So she lives alone too. Um, she has her um, way of living that she's very confident about, but it turns out that it has nothing to do with morals or values. It's just uh, based in her experiences. So things change and she throws every value uh, away when she wants to do something that doesn't fit with her values. Uh, season three covers Isaac. We will see him later. He uh, discovers that he is gay. So you see this relationship between him and this uh, boy he falls in love with. And that's when this series just rocketed to the sky. Because people were waiting for when is he going to admit that he is gay? When is he going to tell everybody? What is his mother going to say? She's uh, deeply religious, but she's also um, not healthy. Um, she is uh, not seeing the world in a healthy way. What is she going to say? Her, his father is distant, and you are going to be—you're going to see uh, uh, this pattern of grown-ups here. Uh, so everybody was updating: Is he? Are they going to find together? What's happening? Uh, and we, s for the first time in Norwegian um, TV history, see this gay relationship evolving uh, and and engaging people. 
now we have season four. It's springtime, second year at high school. Uh, and we see this uh, faithful Muslim, Sana, that falls in love with a boy she believes is a Muslim. So she's so happy, but it turns out he doesn't believe in Allah. What can she do? Uh, she dresses in black. Black is her happy color. This show is very... Um, they are trying to teach the kids uh, about subtle hints. So they're using colors very deliberately. So she has black as her happy color. But that's to uh, show that she is so strong. But is she so strong when she cannot choose the one she wants? Uh, so there are a couple of things that makes this show very special and that's why it's sold to the states. Uh, some of it is about the uh, what it's about, but some of it is about the platforms used, the innovative use of media platforms. Every day you get either a clip, two or three, maybe six or seven minutes long. Uh, you get messenger conversations, you get Instagram pictures. Uh, every one of these characters has got their own account on Instagram uh, and on Messenger. You won't see them on Facebook, but that's because of the, the Facebook uh, rules. It's not allowed. Uh, some of the side characters even have their own YouTube channel. And if you don't know that, if you don't see that in uh, social media, you won't know it because it's not portrayed uh, in the series. So you have to be everywhere to get everything. Uh, because every Friday they collect all of the clips and some of these um, Instagram photos, but only from the main character. So if you want to see what Isaac is doing now, you have to follow Isaac on his Instagram. Uh, and that gives them the opportunity to have some people sitting at the broadcaster making Instagram pictures, messenger conversation that is seemingly happen happening today. This is a conversation between Noah and Sana uh, happening uh, earlier this May when our king and our queen celebrated their 80th anniversary. Uh, and she's commenting on this. How uh, how do you feel about this celebration? The same day, the same time, it's posted when the celebration uh, at the castle were happening. Uh, this happens all the time. When it's Easter, they go on Easter vacation in known uh, skiing resorts in Norway. So it feels so real. And that's why when, when they don't behave, when, when they don't do what you want them to do, you just, oh, come on, can I? So people are commenting. You can comment whenever something is posted, you can comment. And since it's uh, finished, the, the, the finished product is uh, made so closely to when they are releasing it, sometimes the production team listens to the commentators and changes some of the story. So you feel that you really have something to say in this case. So your heart is mattering. Your feeling is mattering. Someone is seeing you. They feel like friends. And we know that when the story is so close to your own life, it will affect you such, uh, so much deeper than if it's a totally different world. Um, they show, I have to say one more thing, that, because that's funny. Uh, do you know about the reality show Paradise Hotel? It's an American show, uh, which has been running in Norway too for many, many years. They are, uh, there are lots of naked people living in a hotel, and they're not naked, they just forgot to put on more than bikinis. Um, living in a hotel and trying to be uh, couples as long as possible before someone is sent home. It's a very... Um, my kids are not allowed to watch. Uh, and every week they have this theme 
And one week not long ago, they had shame as a theme on Paradise Hotel. So some of the characters in shame commented, what is happening on Paradise Hotel this week? <laughs> That's so funny. They say, they are trying to be as authentic as possible to the 16 year olds. Um, the, the actors are close in age. I think he is 17 or 18 year olds. Um, most of them are eight, 17 or 18 year olds. So then they are not very old. They are not experienced. They are quite new, everyone. But they are amazingly good. And that's, um, that's one of the reasons behind this success. They are so talented. Uh, but the themes they cover are so basic that grown-ups feel at home. They feel touched and they feel it's real to their lives. Um, and the target group still relates, even if we as grown-ups relate. The, the target group, the 16, 17-year-olds, they feel it's their show. And since the, um, the tactics were that they were not advertising, they were not uh, telling giving interviews even at their own uh, TV channel. They were not talking about this show before the mainstream media discovered it halfway through season two. No advertising at all. So the, the only one knowing about this was the 16 year olds in social media. I discovered it quite early in, in season two. That's why I um, certainly managed to write something before the big newspapers. Um, what are the key popular trends in the series? Where are they looking for hope? We have seen there are no grown-ups. Uh, some are divorced, some are, um, some are um, busy with their careers, uh, some do not care. Some we don't know, where are they? The, the only grown-up we meet is in this season. In season four, we see Sana's mother, but she's weak. She's caring, but she's weak. And as a Muslim mother, she does not have the answer to Sana's question. Sana is asking lots of questions. Why does Islam say this? Why does Islam say that? I don't know. She says, why do, do you have to answer, to ask all of these questions? Um, They are, when they are used, they are only used as a tool to show uh, the difference, the conflicts between generations. What do they do? They choose their own family. That's kind of a character of the postmodern times. We choose our own families. We leave our home towns. Uh, and if a family is kind of a support system and it breaks down, you just choose a new one. Uh, they turn to their friends when life is hard, when they should have been supported and guided by uh, grown-ups. Uh, and that reflects how the 16-year-olds in Norway tells us uh, how they relate to social media or to media in general. If they see something, if they experience something, if they do something, uh, that gets them in trouble, they will not tell their parents. They will only go to the, their friends. We have uh, surveys for, from uh, so many years back, and we see this just increasing. 16-year-olds withdrawing from parents, not telling them when they have problems, um, or just telling them tiny bits. That's kind of natural, uh, and at the same time, um, it's sad. They need us. Can we just leave that hanging there until we talk about how to communicate the gospel? Just remember this part. Um, I can. Uh, there are so many things we could comment on, but this is uh, one other major point. If you feel like it, do it. There is no objective moral standard. Uh, Nora. Have you heard this name Nora before? 
And Nora is a name in Ibsen's, Henrik Ibsen's play, The Dollhouse. Uh, her character is not built on, the, on uh, the dollhouse, but everybody else of the female characters is built on Nora from the dollhouse. Uh, but the name is from there. Eve from the Bible, Isaac from the Bible, everything matters in this show. She, uh, the author is so uh, well structured and planned. Uh, Nora has uh, decided not to have sex before marriage doesn't last very long. She has decided not to drink alcohol. Doesn't last very long. It's a tragic uh, thing that she does and it's a tragic um, circumstances when she does, but she does. Uh, she's the one that follows the rules and even her abandons the rules. If you don't feel like it anymore, just change it to something that feels comfortable to you, that you want to do. Uh, they try to navigate from their feelings. Um, there are actually some limits. You're not allowed to let your faith and religion uh, have consequences. And at least if, you, if they have for you, not for others. Uh, the theme is always the same. You do whatever feels right for you as long as you don't make me have the same standards. And they show great respect for the different decisions people are making. And they don't, uh, they're not surprised when people are turning around and doing something totally different because they, they are doing it themselves. If you can then, can, then I can, that's freedom for everybody. And that's important to understand the show title. If there is no reason to feel guilty because I did what I felt was right, then there is no reason, uh, there is no explanation for the feeling I have. I feel guilty, but I am not guilty. Then I am ashamed of myself, of who I am and what I am, not for what I am doing. Where do you go when you fail? What do you do? The third point that's very, very, um, I heard John Lennox saying today that it's hard to talk about your personal faith. This series shows totally the different reality. They are talking about faith all the time. They are talking about atheist versus Muslim. They are talking about Isaac's mother being a, a conservative Christian. Uh, they are talking about naturalism, about what cons consequences uh, your worldview has for your uh, uh, some of the dis decisions Sana is making. Uh, and the 16 year olds watching this saying, that's how it is. We can talk about this as long as you don't make me believe what you, make, you believe. Uh, and that's, the show has received a lot of praise for the way they talk about these things. The scene in this season, season four, that has been uh, receiving the most praise is when Sana, the main character, is talking to Yusuf, which she is in love with, reasons to believe in Allah and why he doesn't. How can you believe in a God that doesn't allow gay people to get married? That's why I left Allah, he said. And she says in an earlier episode that uh, if your sexuality is only naturalism, she has a, this uh, explanation that says it might actually be you that is wrong, that Allah is right. Um, that has made young people think through what is, why do I feel or think what I think? How to be young in a multi multicultural society. This series is, this show is uh, totally new. I think not just in Norway, I think in Europe too. Um, the faith system they have is still quite floating. Some of the characters are, they are only 16, so they are trying to find their way uh, when what they think they want 
is colliding with reality or they change what they want in life. Uh, Sana, who is a devout Muslim, she prays five times a day. You hear her app on her phone ringing when it's time for pray prayer. And she goes to pray in the middle of a party. But suddenly she falls in love with not the right person and she struggles. So you mentioned uh, the topic uh, that's in the title as well, shame. That's something that we want to spend some time on because uh, it is something that is particularly evident in the series and in youth culture as a, as a whole. So uh, Anna Solfrid, she will give some examples from the series on mm. where the characters experience shame. But uh, first, what are we talking about when we're talking about shame? A couple of days before ELF uh, the gathering, ELF they sent out uh, an, an email with some short uh, videos on shame, actually, with Richard Winter and Ed Welsh. And uh, those videos were great if you want to learn more about the topic of uh, shame. Uh, so I, I recommend those videos. But in short, uh, it is so common to contrast shame with, uh, with guilt. When I'm guilty, you know, it's because I have done something wrong. An action. If I uh, slap you in the face, uh, I will have to confess and apologize. And if you're still not okay with me slapping you in the face, uh, you could tell the police and I would be in trouble. Uh, and that would be a proper way to deal with guilt, you know. Uh, it's an action, something I've done, and you deal with that. Uh, and I shouldn't even feel ashamed of slapping someone in the face because it's a terrible thing to do. So it would be natural to feel shame uh, because of guilt. But in contrast with guilt, shame is the feeling that I either have done something wrong or even that I am wrong. There is something wrong with me as a person. It often concerns my whole identity. And the deep feeling uh, of shame is the pain of seeing yourself as someone that does not deserve to be loved. And that is harder to deal with than just guilt. You deal with guilt by uh, telling that you're sorry or taking some kind of punishment. But that sort of shame, that, is that feeling, it's harder to deal with. Because if the problem is that I am wrong, how do I make that right again? How do I fix that? And sometimes we're even ashamed of stuff that we cannot do anything about. And uh, a funny story from my own life. A couple of years ago, it was winter in Norway, and my car was parked down in the streets. And uh, the road was all icy, so when I locked up my car, there was this woman passing by. And she really fell on the ice so hard. She was sliding in a perfect bow and landed on her back. Uh, it looked so painful and I was the only person around. So how do you think I reacted to seeing this woman uh, falling on the ice? Uh, you know, a, a really uh, Christ-like and loving thing to do would be to go and ask if she needed some, uh, some help. But my spontaneous reaction, my reflex was that I just uh, threw myself down beneath my own car uh, to hide away. And the reason why I did that was because when I fall on the ice, it's so embarrassing when people watch me falling. So uh, as uh, an action of genuine love to that woman, uh, <laughs> I just hid away so she wouldn't see that I saw her falling. Uh, but, but it must have looked weird. And I'm not so proud of that mo moment, you know, when, there's so many old women washing from the windows and it must have looked so stupid when a woman was lying on the ice uh, in pain and hurt and a guy was hiding behind his car. <laughs> but uh, I get embarrassed when I fall on the ice, even though uh, it's not offensive to someone. And uh, I haven't, I'm not guilty of doing something wrong when I fall on the ice, it's just embarrassing. And uh, that is a typical feeling of shame that is not connected to any moral guilt, you know, it's just embarrassing. But that reaction I had, hiding, that is also so typical when it comes to shame and guilt. Instead of expressing the things we're guilty of and ashamed of, we often hide it away, cover it up and never deal with those 
things or we don't deal with it in a proper, helpful way. And that is also a common theme in the series, shame. So the characters, very often, they experience this feeling of shame. And they do what I did uh, with a the car, they just hide it away, cover it up, and they don't deal with it in a proper way. And so on the Solfred, she's going to give some examples on how that shame is expressed in the series. And we're going to finish up with uh, sharing some thoughts on how to deal with that from a biblical perspective. You remember this story the first time? Man hides out of shame. They uh, had they admitted we did something wrong. Sorry. I believe this is uh, one of the key um, questions to always ask when we see shame. This TV show. What would have happened if they admitted that they were wrong? They are doing wrong things all the time. They are cheating, they are lying. We are going to see some, some uh, examples. But never once have I seen a heartfelt I am so sorry. Once, sorry, once. There is uh, one time uh, one of the girls says, I am so sorry, I know I did something wrong. Uh, but the consequences are following. Uh, they have to live with, with the consequences uh, of not being honest for many, uh, for a long time. In the first season, we see Eva coming to the school. Uh, she has one friend. The problem is that she uh, takes this friend's boyfriend. So now she has no girlfriends, she has a boyfriend. She meets Nora, and she's wondering, can I add her on Facebook? Will that uh, show that I am lonely? She is ashamed of her being lonely, and she will not reveal it. So she is contemplating for a long time. Can I add her on Facebook? Can I not? What is this telling about me? Uh, we are God's family. We can offer a house, we can offer ears to listen, we can offer someone something to the youth that are saying that they are lonely. In Norway, one third of all of the youth are saying deep down, I am so lonely, I have friends, but I am so lonely. It's a problem for me, one third of all of the youth. What can we do as grown-ups? Uh, Eva, if she even cheats on her boyfriend because she thinks he is cheating on her. So she has to be first. So if he leaves, it's not so embarrassing for her. She regrets it so much. Uh, another example is the greats, the marks. They're receiving a paper they have done. The boys are doing good, asking her, what, how did it go? Ah, uh, no. Nah. And she tells her what she got. It was in the, in the middle. So we have one to six and she got the four minus. Um, and they try to comfort her. Okay, that's not very, that's not very good. You can do better, but okay. When she gets home, we get to see a glimpse of what she really got. She didn't got, get the four minus. She was making herself a liar for half a grade. If she said, I got five plus, but she was making herself a liar for so little. And the amazing, <laughs> the, the, they have made such an effort in this series. The paper is on guilt. Schul means guilt. And look at this question mark. She hasn't even been able to define what guilt is. This series is, you can go through every bit of these two or three minutes. They have made so many of these hints. Um, 
And it's not, not all, only about marks, it's about fear. Fear of the future, fear of who I am, am I good enough? Um, fear of jobs, the job situation is changing even in Norway. Am I going to make it? Identity, image. Uh, some, um, someone comments on this girl's uh, appearance. She's named Vilde. And it changes everything. She tries to survive on chewing gum and Diet Coke. Here she's eating her salad. Uh, I'm just sorting my salad. I don't think you're able to sort it anymore, is the response. She wants to eat low carb, so she, she takes away all the maize. Um, it's about who they are, what kind of friends they have, which parties they go to, what kind of lipstick they wear. Everything is about image, the right image. This series, this TV show is so close to how the, um, the, the 16 year olds and even the 10 year olds feel that uh, during season two, uh, Norwegian hairdressers ran out of blue shampoo, <laughs> the one that makes the hair grayish, and red lipsticks, because that's what the Norm um, wears. You can see 10 year olds all over Oslo, in special, uh, with the long hair, cut off hair, light gray and red lipstick. Uh, and that's only the image. Think about what it does to their hearts. Uh, and that touches upon what you were saying. If they can handle it, look at her. She's pretty. If she says that she's not good enough, how about me? Uh, and she says, I know that I am okay. I'm just not good enough, she says. Just not good enough is what she says here. I know I'm quite okay, quite, but that's not enough. Uh, she even thinks she's pregnant because she has grown a belly. And she gets to the doctor and, and she takes this positive test, but it turns out she, it wasn't a pregnancy test she took. <laughs> Um, the, it, she didn't have a belly because she was pregnant. It was because of the Diet Coke and the chewing gum. <laughs> Too much air. Uh, sexual inexperience. Being 16 and not having had sex, being a virgin, that's very embarrassing. Uh, doesn't Whoever, you don't have to love him. If you are to kiss someone, then you have to love them because that's much more intimate than having sex. So we have this new word, hooking. Uh, that's when two people kiss and make out. Um, that's spread around the world like... Uh, even, almost, even my parents know the word hooking. And that's... They, they, that's much more valuable for them than the sex. The sex is just to be a part of, uh, of a re relationship or in, to be accepted. So she jumps in bed with, um, jumps to bed with the, the, the bad boy at school and suddenly it hits her. What if he is bragging about this? So she, he, she goes to tell him, please do not brag about this. And he says, brag about this, I don't remember you. You are not nice enough. You're not pretty enough. I don't remember you. Um, and then sexual identity. We could have talked a lot about that. Uh, but he's trying to hide who he is by kissing a girlfriend. Uh, and when she finds out that he is gay, she's telling him that I'm not angry about her, uh, about you for cheating, that's okay, but for leading me on, believing that you loved me. Cheating is okay because that was, that felt right, right for you. Uh, his boyfriend also has a girlfriend which he leaves, nobody comments on that, that's okay. Everybody understands that he had a bigger, and that was something that he felt he had to do. It's worse to be traditional and boring. 
uh, than to try the different identities and to hide who you might be if you don't try it. You cannot know if you're gay if you haven't tried a gay relationship. What if I miss something? Uh, so the shame can reach everyone, those that belong to a minority and those that wants to belong to a mi minority. That's those who are normal are just as ashamed. And the list could go on. Um, it's not about what I own or my position or my, it's about my self-worth, who am I, my identity. We are almost finished, ready for questions. Uh, we are just going to, what does it, this mean for us working with youth? There are some, we are always looking for points of contact and points of tension. Uh, every story can give us a pointer to who is God because God has created us. And there are so many things in this TV show that we can actually say, this is good. The way they, they greet each other when they have trouble, when they, when they finally are honest, way better than we do in my generation, way better. There are so many things we can say, this is so amazing how they react. Uh, but what uh, we have to watch it with discernment. We have to see what does the Bible say that is different from what this is telling us about life. Uh, Nora, this picture is from when Nora is sexually abused, or she thinks she is sexually abused, and she feels so shameful. I shouldn't have been to that party. I shouldn't have been drinking. I should have left. I must have said something to lead him on. It's my fault. And he sends her a really, really ugly message. Uh, and it, it, by now, the story has come so far that it's supposed to be a trial, but she doesn't show up because she is to too ashamed to let everybody know what, she's happened, what happened to her. But when there is no given value to life, you have to create value, and that's hard work. And when the, those values change all the time, how can you know that you will get a reward for that hard work? Uh, I like the fact that these characters rarely do wrong just to be evil, like we see in lots and lots and lots of TV shows reaching young um, kids and youth. They do it because they are selfish, or they are young, or they, are, they feel pressure to do something. They feel alone. They feel like, like they do not have a choice. But they do not admit it. We talked about that. Um, Eva, Eve, tells Wilde, everybody with respect for themselves get drunk so bad that they uh, faint sometimes. If not, you're not accepted by us. It's okay to do bad things. You have to try something. Um, I love the way they talk about religion. They talk about how someone chooses to believe what's in a book, even when we are in 2017. How can we equip the young generation to deal with these questions? Even though it kind of reflects something that is already there in the secular world, it, it also brings in something new to the youth culture. So this is coming, so it's important, but we have to confirm that longing this youth so We can disagree with their way of life, but we have to uh, confirm that longing for something genuine, something deeper, and show them that this is found in Christ. Uh, <laughs> That's perhaps why this is really important. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. We have to confirm the value of people, but also take people seriously as responsible human beings that need forgiveness. And I think that is really important when uh, connecting with teenagers. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.